Welcome back, everyone. We're here live at IoT Live number two. It's IoT Day 2015. And before we get started on the panel, I just want to remind everyone that if you like, um, on iotlive.org backslash watch, you'll see a, a question that we posted for the poll. And the question for this panel will be um, that we want the audience to vote on is in what industry are platforms gaining the most traction? So please visit uh, iotlive.org to submit your vote on that. And now, um, with with all further ado, I'd like to introduce Glenn Olmendinger. He is the president of Harbor Research. Harbor Research is a research and consulting firm that was founded in 1984 that focuses on smart systems and the Internet of Things. Glenn and his team are seen as thought leaders and, and a consulting firm with many uh, different clients ranging from small technology startups to large technology arms merchants and OEMs as well. And so with that, I'd like to introduce the president, Glenn Almendinger. Thank you, Alex. Um, first, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for um, attending IoT Live today. I think it's a, a great, great event. But I'd also really like to thank our uh, panel members for participating. Uh, Tom Baraducci from Zebra, Doug uh, Stanley from uh, NEO, James Brennigan from Bright Wolf, and uh, Hans Ruppel from Exosite. Um, what I'd like to do is actually go around to each uh, panel member just to set context and uh, discussion on panels today and ask each one of us to um, uh, introduce yourselves, kind of sense of your background and uh, current activities and maybe kind of what the focus and direction of your current panel activities are, uh, 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 platform activities, excuse me, and kind of where you're heading and uh, where, you see, um, where you see yourself in the market, I guess is really just a starting position to set context. Tom, why don't we start with you? Hi, Glenn. I'm Tom Berriducci, uh, Director of Product Management for Zebra Technologies New Growth Platforms Group, uh, focusing on the IoT, specifically our Zatar uh, IoT platform. And um, for those of you who don't know, Zebra's a fairly big company, about 7,000 employees after our recent acquisition of Motorola uh, Enterprise Solutions. Zebra is basically a hardware company. Makes a lot of barcode printers and handhelds and all types of devices. And so an IoT platform makes a lot of sense for us. But we're doing this not just for Zebra, but for uh, a lot of companies. Our goal is to enable IoT platform capabilities to a lot of hardware devices out there, focusing mainly on the enterprise, B2B, supply chain type applications, all different types of verticals associated with that. So thanks a lot. Happy to be here. Thank you, Tom. Doug? Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Doug Stanley. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of NEO. Uh, NEO is uh, the product of a lot of years of imagination. Uh, our primary objective is to take the friction out of universally connecting things and applying intelligence. And when we say intelligence, we mean all the way up the adoption curve, including full automation. <clears throat> Over the years, I've found that you know, solutions that force a certain process on the users obviously then get pushed back. Uh, we're looking to take the friction out of that adoption cycle by enabling users to adopt and advance their adoption on a progressive basis as you know their workflows and applications uh, mature. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a lot of fun. We we eased out of snell, out of stealth in December, and uh, but those of you that know us, we're a little bit of a new venture with a twist. We uh, we actually had the benefit of of developing a very advanced version of this in my past life. I was the creator of the innovation practice at Deloitte, and uh, received enough validation and opened enough eyes that we felt we needed to go do this and get it to market. And so it's. Uh, Really very exciting time, and we're pleased to be here. Excited to be on this panel. Thank you, Doug. Hans? Sure. Uh, my name's Hans Rempel. I'm the CEO and founder of Exosite. Um, I actually kicked off Exosite in 2009 because I was working uh, for a company actually doing product realization, actually for some of the other uh, members here on the panel, designing you know, full products from the ground up, including an 8, 16, 32-bit microcontroller, no OS, full OS. And all of these product manufacturers 
they own the real estate in the real world, right? They have the product placement on the shelf. They have the installation on the wall and, uh, or, or on a desktop. And what they realized is that, you know, if I could also somehow gain access to my data or somehow provide that data as information at the right place at the right time to my stakeholders, I could leverage uh, that real estate that I own to greater lengths. And back in 2009, it wasn't known as the Internet of Things. That, that term has come out, and the Internet of Everything has come out in, in the meantime. But when we started Exosite at that time, we knew that the need and the opportunity to help durable goods manufacturers connect their products to their stakeholders was so critical for the future success and for the business model kind of evolution for those companies. And today we're known as the platform of choice uh, for durable goods manufacturers wanting to connect their products to their stakeholders in a way that creates economic value uh, for those organizations. Great. Thank you, Hans. James, um, I think we've got audio. Yep. Is this working? Right. One? Okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad it's working. Sorry for that. Um, I had to grab my headset here. I am the co-founder and platform architect of Brightwolf. We are a software platform um, founded in 2009, helping large enterprises build end-to-end -end connected systems. And our approach is to offer a full service offering from the embedded system um, all the way up to the cloud. And we basically fill the gaps that exist in the enterprises, IT and software and hardware development teams to help them bring and realize a full end-to-end -end connected solution. Great, thank you very much, James. Um, but maybe to set context and uh, get right to some questions here, um, I guess as I or we have watched the evolution of all of this uh, connected physical world evolve, and I, I would like Hans's comment, the IoT um, hype is only the uh, recent chapter of many names, pervasive, ubiquitous, uh, machine to machine, and long history. But I kind of look at platform technology, it's kind of evolved out of you know multiple parallel legacies. Uh, uh, MVNOs and M2M cellular kinds of apps and transportation and fleets. You've got um, like the Pacific Controls presentation and folks that are trying to drive information leverage out of building systems and facility borne systems and and uh, like the Exosite story, largely uh, a third crowd I think that's been evolved out of largely you know capex, big high value, high economic value and use equipment. So I think. First question I really like to ask is how do you see you know what is the essence of platform? It's one of the most maligned terms these days out there in the marketplace. If you ask getting people what a platform is, you'll get 20 answers. But I guess the question really is, what do you think is essential to these platforms as we look forward in the uh, evolution of smart connected systems? And um, how do you see yourself and what key functions do you see these platforms really needing to perform? And, and, and essentially, what kind of coverage of apps do you uh, anticipate? Um, Tom, why don't we start with you, if that's all right? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right when you said platform is a is a kind of a broad term. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what do you really, really need to do? I think a lot of this, some of it's been touched on already, but for an IoT platform, which is different than, you know, than other platforms that might be out there that don't really touch the physical world, an IoT platform, the key thing is you have to be able to co connect uh, devices and for it to be really successful, you have to be able to connect a, a diverse class of hetero, you know heterogeneous device types, right? And you have to you have to really lower the barriers to make that connectivity easy. And so you know to the extent you can use you know standards to support that you know very easy connection and uh, rich connectivity, it you know that's what you need to do because if you can't connect the devices, you're not going to get the developers. You don't get the developers and the hardware manufacturers, and you don't really have an IoT platform. It's really kind of table stakes, but there aren't a lot of uh, real mature standards out there to use, and so there are some gaps that need to be worked on. But key there is you know r reducing, like uh, like was said, reducing friction, lower barriers to heterogeneous device type connection. So that's number one. If you don't do that, then you're you're kind of dead. On top of that then you have to build value, right? Because just having a pipe to a device is not all that interesting. And everybody's, you know, oh, I got my device on the Internet, so what, right? You know, what do you do with it? How do you share access to the data and the device? How do you provide the correct, the correct permissions and security and all the stuff that everybody wants on top of all that? Creating the ability to have an ecosystem for applications, which is everybody wants to do that, right? But putting all that together, Oh, it's a lot of work. So that's what I think we need to be uh, looking at. That's great. 
Um, Doug, comments? No, I completely agree. I think the if you think about the application of to call it what you will, you know, things, anything, everything, <laughs> it's really about putting the users first. Uh, I think the days of the you know the big stack, you know, ERPs that say this is the way it works. We're going to shove it down your throat. Uh, and then the user just go off and use Excel and Word and all various subsystems, right, um, giving kind of the proverbial finger to IT. Um, I think those days are coming to an end. Um, I think that, you know, we're in a position now that the ability to customize the user experience, the ability to apply solutions in a workflow basis that are very, very specific to the problem you're trying to solve uh, are right now. Uh, it's the basis of our company. Um, it's, it's identifying these friction points, not just from getting it connected and getting it to web. Um, we certainly see that cycle. We see a lot of energy around, you know, just get it to the cloud, we'll take it from here. Um, we take a little bit of a different stance on that. We think that the, that the ecosystem includes the chip. We think the ecosystem includes the device. And for all of the players or actors in this system to be good, to be uh, good, good stewards, they all have to be able to have their own level of autonomy and intelligence. Um, you have to know that they're still in the that they're still on the stage, so to speak, to to use a Donald Norman. Um, so I think the the shift that we're seeing is, at least the shift that we're trying to drive, is one where. Uh, we're putting the users first. Uh, we're letting users work on their terms. Uh, the ability to work heterogeneously. I always, I always like to look for the, the platforms that say we're a platform, but yeah, but you've got to use this. You've got to use that. You've got to use this. You've got to oh gee, a different OS. Oh my God, a different type of this. I think those days are coming to an end, right? I think that we have the ability to create solutions that solve problems. And things that are inherently should be assumed like security. I don't want to make I don't want to make light of that. Um, but those are table stakes. I mean security is table stakes. What's absolutely priority is putting the users in the front and the edge of the wedge of all of these solutions. And to me that's what makes a platform. Right? Not not how much marketing hype, not the budget, but how much you can actually put the users first and eliminate the friction in their lives. So enough of, enough of my high horse. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, Doug. Jane, how about uh, your perspective on the essence of platform? <laughs> sure. So I think you know what when we look at the space, what we've seen over time is kind of an evolution of the platforms. At first, you saw very basic device management platforms that were helping you do things to configure the platform, get it um, out into the market for very simple devices. Now you've seen more of an evolution towards system of record platforms that are trying to help build those connected applications that are targeted at specific tasks, like was just mentioned, that really put the user first. And then where we see it going um, in the future is towards data exchanges. So as people have started to collect and aggregate this data um, from their enterprise or across their customer base, how do they then take that data and start to monetize it? Um, through a various set of marketplaces that have yet to be discovered and really implemented. And so when you look at it, it comes from a focus on basic functionality and capturing the data to managing and integrating the data with different sources to really exploring the true value of IoT down the road. And that's where we think the power of platforms really lies is helping shepherd applications through that journey from basic connection to monetizing the information Hans, I didn't mean to leave you last. I'll, I'll flip the order around. <laughs> How's your perspective on this? Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, you know the interesting thing we have, um, you know, about seventy-five folks on staff here, and, and we have guys both from the embedded side and also guys from the web services side, and um, the, the 
interesting thing to that is when you ask the web services guys what's the most difficult thing, they say, ah, oh, it's the embedded stuff, it's the hardware. And when you ask the hardware guys what's the most difficult thing, they say, oh, it's the security or the you know the users in the cloud. And and really uh, for the Internet of Things, um, the the really the successful platforms and the evolution of the platforms is looking both at the northbound and the southbound, the users and the devices, and saying how can we connect these clouds of expertise together so that innovation can happen and as um, I believe uh, Tom was saying that you know it is about users right and that uh, and, and when you look at IOT and you look at IOT platforms you know someone recently challenged me and said you know IOT is just middleware right you're just connecting from one thing to another thing but I think it's it, it behooves all of us who are moving uh, IOT forward in these early days of innovation in the space uh, to to try to understand who are our users right who who you know will be the users for IOT as there are users for CRM for ERP for MRP who are these people and creating the interfaces creating the workflows uh, to make them successful to give them a home uh, you know like a salesforce.com uh, to CRM right an exosite to IOT right you need you need to have uh, that that understanding of your user base to build these things out and to then allow this uh, kind of northbound integration within vertical markets we call it the the micro vertical challenge of the Internet of Things and uh, you know our platform we look at it as the you know as the micro vertical engine right we can crank these things out by connecting um, the different uh, clouds of expertise together and then addressing the different industries while focusing on the specific user types that are becoming uh, apparent now uh, as, as we do uh, you know we help uh, companies uh, realize their IOT strategies and visions Right, thanks. You know, if we did ask the question, you know, what the hell is the definition of a platform, we could also ask the question, what is in fact an IoT app? Um, but but the, the question I like to reach to is, um, who's building all these apps and, and how will that get organized or how will that get enabled and, and done? I, If we say we're uh, trying to integrate the physical world and lots of machines and sensors and actuators and all sorts of um, arcane but getting more intelligent devices, um, you know, that world is full of a lot of operators and users and beneficiaries, but I would not describe it as a well-organized um, bunch of programmers or developers. Um, so how do you think all this might get done from an app uh, perspective? James, why don't, we, why don't we go to you first this time? Sure. So what we've noticed, um, and as it was just mentioned, there are really disparate groups of skills that are needed to bring a whole solution to market, is that there are not a lot of folks right now that have those skills. Yeah. And so a lot of the failures you'll see, especially if people try to use their internal teams, is they may be an expert on the IT side and not the embedded side, and they'll fail there or vice versa. And so our approach as a company today is really to be a full service offering and fill those gaps um, that a customer may have to help them bring an end-to-end -end solution to, to market. Um, long term, we think those skills will become more popular in the market. You'll start seeing students with some of these skills coming out that actually cross the, the boundaries, and we think there will be growth of developer ecosystems over time. Um, but right now, there's a real dearth of talent in the market um, that can build these systems end to end. Agree. Tom, any perspective on apps, app development? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I mean, if, if you look at history and look at it, that helps us to understand kind of how things are going. Apple and Google, great examples people always use about how they build out uh, their ecosystems. And to a certain extent, I, I don't want to belittle anything that these guys have done. They've been fantastic. But it's easier when you have one device type, you know, one device type, and you're going to enable a platform for people to write apps. Now, the fact that there are billions of apps for uh, these devices uh, says they did a lot of things right. And one thing they did was they made it really simple to write an app for that, for that device. And I think one of those, the, it's a tougher job for the IoT, but it's something we all have to do. And I think a couple people touched on it. The key thing here is to decouple the knowledge required to connect the device from the knowledge required to write the app for the device, right? And by abstracting away the device details through some sort of abstraction layer, which everybody's trying to do, you do that. And that's, that's number one. And the second key is to allow the app guys, because they're the ones who understand the problem. They have a problem they need to solve, right? And they're either working on behalf of a customer or they are the customer. And to enable them to write apps. Now, 
you know, what a lot of the, the smartphone manufacturers do is they come up with their own, their own environment, their own IDE, their own uh, tools required, and that's one way to go. But uh, I think it's much easier and much more scalable to just enable people to write apps with any tool they want, right? I mean, use whatever you want. Now, you know, cloud-based apps are written with whatever you want, HTML5, JavaScript. You can write apps on smartphones and connect to a cloud service. And why make people relearn what they already know and love, okay? Let them write apps the way they want to write apps. As long as you have the appropriate API there that abstracts away the hardware, then you can let the hardware guys do what they do and let the app guys do what they do, and they can proceed, and that's how you're going to get scale. So I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir, but that's, that's kind of like the holy grail of IoT, and that's what we all need to do. Good. Hans? Yeah, so when we look at the kind of the evolution, especially on the application side, you're you're seeing that today in certain industries where, you know, if you get one light bulb from one IoT light bulb company and another light bulb from another, you have to install two apps, right? So you're already seeing some of these connectivity elements in the application side through things like, you know, the, the Wink platform that you can buy IoT, you know, consumer home automation products. Uh, in Home Depot, you know, and and you know myself, I I love playing with uh, with these devices as well, and just to understand and learn about trends, and you know, getting that you can get any number of uh, device manufacturers into a uh, you know single user interface that works for that consumer in that type of market. And really when we map IoT evolution, we've, we've mapped it into kind of five phases. And we believe today we're in the third phase of evolution of the industry. And that is creating a lot of these, these kind of oil wells, drilling one at a time, trying to create these um, these uh, kind of end-to-end -end solutions. And that's a really expensive way uh, to go about this. And phase four, we believe, you know, we're seeing this when we're working with many of our partners on kind of a ubiquitous connectivity, right? So that the, with the federation of the data across the different device types, as well as the inherent building blocks of IoT are just inherently connected. Some of the chips and some of the modules and some of the uh, devices that make up the things of the Internet of Things, the inherent connectivity. And then we really think phase five is really on that North uh, bound uh, industry specific basis, right? These applications now standardizing and finding that, oh, you know what, for this industry, and you see this already like in smart grid, you know, uh, you see that they're saying, hey, if you're going to provide data to us, we don't care what device, what server set you're using. This is what we need as a utility, right? You're seeing this in home automation for like Wink type platforms. And we believe on a per industry basis, really the applications will begin to coalesce and their requirements from everything below it um, will uh, also begin to be standardized and defined. Great. Thanks, Hans. Doug, I know before Neo and you were at Deloitte, you, <laughs> you had a lab where you were trying to connect lots of disparate things and build apps. What's your What's your view on how app development will evolve? Yeah, Glenn, as you know, I mean, uh, we we fought viciously going off and building what we felt was the the necessary platform. Uh, you know, our clients paid us many millions of dollars to try to solve problems uh, that, frankly, the market wasn't able to solve. Um, so, in essence, we 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 led our horses to water, and then we told them there was no water to drink. Uh, this would be, of course, after if it, the typical. Uh, good consultant is we first thing you do are the business cases that expose you know all of the cost and value associated with things like latency and disparate data and walled gardens and user adoption issues and you know all of those things so um, I think the you know with us we started by saying look at there are there are simple problems that we can solve simply but then what we found is that the burden to IT was so great um, that you just, you just couldn't get adoption. You couldn't, you couldn't get them to pull the trigger. So lots of pilots, lots of playing, um, you know, lots, of, lots of hype, but no full embrace adoption. The, the epiphany that I had is that you know, with 85% of the enterprise buck, uh, IT buck going to things that are already purchased and installed, uh, no solution is going to become a platform unless it embraces the as-is. Um, if, if we're not able to take the existing um, uh, SCADA and various other auto ID systems 
If you're not able to embrace those and, and, and again, bring those in, as Hans says, into the Federation, I think this may be just another balloon that'll pop, right? It's, it's great, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, but at the end of the day, it's about creating value. It's about unlocking value. And if we bring another thing that IT's got to stop what they're doing and install, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, so um, now, when you say it's not going to happen, there'll be these, you know, these uh, these specific oil wells, as, as Hans points out, of traction. And um, but to me, we'll we'll get to IO fill in your your favorite letter or word, you know, when we don't even know we're there. It's just happening. It's a little bit like mobile, right? It's just happening. Um, and those, to me, are you know, we have to talk about it. We've got to we've got to beat the crap out of IT. Um, you know, it's it's we're not there yet. Um, so, I think we're we're getting very close. I actually don't I don't I don't know if I completely agree um, with the burden of talent. That you know, talent doesn't get it. Uh, I take a different spin. I think that that strong solution architects, uh, technologists, if they're presented the right solution. There's not really much to get; it just works, right? And uh, and again, not to be not to be mom and apple pie about this. I think, but I think that's the the pressure on all of us that are that are working toward this, you know, this heterogeneous. It just works. Goal, right? So, thanks. I think the next context I like to poke at is, I guess, maybe an architectural um, view of all this, and you kind of look at the history of this, all these connected device systems over the last 10 or 15 years. Obviously, classic IT, and uh, in many respects, hasn't been present at the party until the last couple of years when everybody sort of piled on the bandwagon. And, you know, that whole batch kind of computing architecture is not really the way this kind of distributed system world will work. And as I think every one of you commented on my first questions are related to kind of what's the essence of platforms we go forward. Obviously, it's shifted drastically from connectivity and pipes to data. and App value, but but if I just look at it from a data standpoint, these so-called edge or distributed systems are going to have to process a lot more and do a lot more things that are unique and not like classic IT things at the edge. That that you know physics won't allow you to ship all this data back to the cloud. Who'd want to do that anyway? Um, so I just said start with the question of as you see um, platforms from an architectural standpoint, what do you think is most acute as we look forward over the next few years in the evolution of architecture and how much of this is going to get done by specialists um, like yourself, as I've always kind of referred to all the people who are uh, brave enough to enter this world, um, versus um, all these uh, infrastructure and IT characters who are descending upon us now? Um, James, why don't we start start with you? Sure. So we definitely see this trend towards more intelligence moving towards the edge as the devices get more and more capable. Um, we already have customers that have had scenarios where they had to pull the data back to the cloud because the devices weren't capable enough in generation one. And then in generation two of the device, they're able to actually perform that operation out on the edge device itself. So we're seeing that, that trend happening already. Um, what I think will enable this to really scale so that it doesn't have to be done by specialists, and it goes back to what was mentioned about lowering the friction. Um, as you move intelligence towards the edge, you need all of these capabilities to manage operations and perform very tight state machines across very difficult communication networks to make sure that the right operation happens when you want it to. Um, but you want to empower the very endmost user of the system to be able to help participate in that operation. So, you know, in a concrete example is the policy for when you can update the firmware, which is a very basic device management capability varies vertical to vertical and may vary end customer business to end customer business. Um, so for example, when is a refrigerated tractor trailer safe to update the firmware on? Well, certainly not while it's um, cooling something, but some people may have business processes that vary from others. And so you want to make the friction to enable that sort of management uh, decision to flow through the entire system very easily. And that's how I think you get scale to when the end users are able to access these capabilities um, directly as opposed to needing to bring it back to specialist panels um, where you might have a role that's device management just for your solution. Doug, <laughs> distributed systems. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, it's, um, 
as you know, we think that that is uh, that is the holy grail, right? Um, from day one with Neo, we we elected to build <laughs> a platform. Uh, and we think we passed the test that that resides seamlessly across this ecosystem, whether it's a chip, whether it's a device, whether it's a server, whether it's a cloud, whether it's a hybrid system. So things like updating the firmware, you know, it's more of a system upgrade than, oh my God, I got to go update this type of device um, or this particular server or this particular, um, you know, network device. Um, we felt that for us to be truly distributed, NEO needs to reside everywhere, right? <coughs> anywhere and everywhere. Um, and if it's not there, it needs to play nice with the things that are there, right? So um, we kind of knew we were on to something early on when we talked to a, a large semiconductor company uh, at a very senior level. And they saw us operating NEO, what is now NEO, in a cloud. They saw us operating it at the time, uh, you know, on a on a small server, but then they saw us operating it at the chip level and able to filter at the actual absolute edge, right? And it scared the crap out of them. The response we got was, we move a lot of silicon because we move noise. Right? <laughs> um, that was my motivation to give up my partnership in a significant uh, firm is that if we had that level of user control, I said, look it, I'm going to put the intelligence where I need it, I'm going to put the level of enrichment where I need it, and then I'm going to incorporate those signal producers or data producers into my ecosystem on a smart way, right? It's, it's you know, it's in essence, it's, it's ability to hit the mute button, right? Um, really lower the dependency on, on, on the traditional IT stack, which is batch-centric is get it all up into the cloud, get it up to the warehouse. Oh my God, then let's figure out what to do with it. Um, I can't cite the source, but I read recently that you know, 90 95% of the, of the data that we're moving into the big data warehouse is, is garbage. Now that works great if you're in the big data business. It works great if you're in the network business. You know, but if you're trying to solve problems, you, know, you get 5% of wiggle room. <laughs> right? And um, and I think that those are the control points that, that we've designed NEO around is, you know, really simply putting NEO, giving the ability to develop these solutions on the user's terms, very, very granular up to, good God, if you want to get it all to the cloud and start from there, God love you, right? We don't care, <laughs> right? We don't care. Thank you, Doug. Um, Tom? Yeah, this yeah, this is a this is a tough one. I, I agree with what's been said about uh, you know Nirvana. Uh, I, I'm not really quite sure how soon it's going to take to get there. I mean, basically, I mean, if you have a, having a policy-driven system that uh, allows you to you know be, have a lot of control over how firmware updates are made is one thing. Okay, that's that's something I think we can all get our heads around. But being able to you know seamlessly move compute power back and forth across the cloud of the edge and do it in a semi-autonomous manner so that uh, the user uh, doesn't have to think about, gee, I want to process this byte here and I want to have this executable over there. Uh, that's, that is cool. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an architect. I'm not sure. I, you know, I don't know how to do that. But uh, that would definitely you know, accelerate innovation uh, in a, a, a massive a massive way because that's something that uh, I think we all think would be fantastic but being able to do it such that I as a user don't have to actually program and figure out well I want this processing to occur here or I want that processing to occur there uh, you know that's that's relatively easy to understand but really really hard to do you wanted to make it you may say make it so that the system can do that for you now that's that's something which uh, I, I think we would all love to see right. that's fair <laughs> that's very fair Hans, any uh, thoughts on architecture and future distributed systems? Yeah, um, you know, I think there's there's the business side and then there's the functionality side. Um, you know, from a from a functionality side, you know, as some people mentioned, as far as table stakes, in order to get organizations who have traditionally trusted 
in-house IT organizations to you know run their mail servers or, or, or file servers or their you know network infrastructure in order to get those organizations confident um, that you know the table stakes of of you know scalability, security, reliability um, of, of the platform, you know, both from a device, uh, from a processing in the cloud, and then from a user perspective, uh, those things have to happen. And and one of the really interesting things that has happened, and really is the reason why devices now are coming online, and why why uh, industries are now embracing Internet of Things, is because those things can be done. Uh, with platforms uh, that are also cost efficient, right? It's not just the server-driven, you know, SCADA system of the past that, uh, you know, um, work very similar to IoT uh, today, uh, but did not have the Cortex-M0 or the Cortex-M4 down on the device that was allowing a very kind of low-cost device, um, as well as the uh, low-cost connectivity and the bandwidth. Uh, you know, to actually get it there, and that cost has come down, and the reliability and the security of these systems has come up, um, really enabling the business models in areas you've never seen business models being enabled before, and that's the fascinating part about the functionality. And when you look at it from a business perspective on how to really kind of re release, uh, you know, the uh, what I would say is pent up demand uh, for the Internet of Things still, and, and I believe still will be pent up demand for the next few years. Um, really, you have to, you know, exercise, you know, has this zero barrier, right? So you lower the barriers for people who are creating the products. Uh, you have the infinite access, right? You want to open APIs. You want to federate with other systems. You don't want to be saying that, uh, you know, I'm, I want your data. It's your data, right? You want to give infinite access uh, to that for, the, for those industries. And then immediate value. You have to be able to help those companies monetize uh, their products. And so really, if you can achieve those three uh, philosophies within your platform from a business perspective, you'll also succeed. Very fair. Uh, maybe switching gears to a business context around platforms. Um, I mean, a lot of the evolution we've talked about um, this morning, we characterized for the last several years as uh, simple apps, compound apps, and complex apps. And simple is kind of alerts, alarms, uh, pub and spoke, point to point kind of monitoring. And compound is my favorite example is if you take a 200 bed hospital and you probably have a couple hundred brands of equipment. Um, and a facility and infrastructure around that, and obviously integration with IT and so forth. And you know, if you look at um, where all the money's made in the hospital, it's larger in surgery, and it's around things like medical imaging, and that is kind of a major domo. And I guess this kind of gets back to an adage my mother always said: "We share because we care." And I'm, I'm just thinking about the hospital CIO at the 55th remote services call from an OEM saying, "Hey, I've got a system," and eventually that CIO sort of apoplexing and understanding that maybe the integration of all these data sources would be useful and, and a point of leverage. Um, how much do you think ecosystem and business relationships, um, aside from technical and platform issues, are an um, inhibitor to all this? Uh, Doug, maybe start coming? <sighs> I'm just trying to raise the stakes, Bob. Wow. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, it, as these yeah. systems become ever more... Yeah, I guess I mean, all of us, I don't, know, I don't know who's sitting in London where this is a reasonable time zone, but uh, for, for those of us on mountain time, good God, Glenn, that's a, that's a mind right, 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 right. thing. All right. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe put a bigger ball. No, look at it. I think I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> that's fair. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I... Um, Again, not to beat not to beat the same drum, but but look at I think that you know we're fighting for a little bit of the a little bit of the the capex, right? Uh, that's not going to change around. I'll use Glenn's metaphor. Uh, you know, I looked at a I looked at a proposal before I before I left uh, the firm and went off and did this new venture. Uh, it was from the VA hospitals. Uh, and every firm in the world was was just clamoring because because frankly it was a billion dollar RFP. Um, you know my my job was a little bit, be a little bit of a scud missile. Uh, we showed up and told the VA this is not deliverable. You can't build this project, right? Uh, what they were what they were aspiring to achieve is what we're talking about today. And this was you know three and a half four years ago. Um, and um, so I, I, I think that 
you know, the applications that will get the most traction, right, Glenn, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's really the question, but are ones that, that allow the users to progressively adopt, whether it's, it's simple, compound, complex, right? I think our systems have to go with the user, right? Um, good God, the last thing we want is to say, oh, now that you want more, you've got to rip out what you have, right? Um, it's not, you know, again, it's just going to delay the adoption cycle uh, even more. Uh, so I think as we're, as we're thinking through our platforms, we have to think about the functionality. Um, I know we all get excited about, you know, people looking at data. I mean, Domo got a $2 billion valuation yesterday, and effectively it's, <laughs> it's better than a spreadsheet. Not, I don't have to be flipping. It's, a great, it's great, right? But, but what's beyond that, right? You know, getting information to people is the simple part, right? At this stage, it should be simple. Um, getting people off of their legacy subsystems, whether it be Excel, um, Google Docs, you know, all of these various things, that's the challenge, right? Um, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I, I think that as platform architects, we have to think all the way up the adoption cycle. We can't think about now. We have to think about embracing now, but having the same, the platform be able to take the journey with the users. All right. So maybe I've had too much coffee or not enough. <laughs> maybe if I simplify the question, which would be, you know, as these systems do become more integrated, more federated, and, and the leverage begins to shift from things like single machines getting monitored, if you will, or, or a single manufacturer's equipment getting monitored to some kind of end-use environment, um, you know, business relationships and ecosystems will play heavily into um, the delivery of these complex systems. So I guess the question really is, is if I leave the, the sort of the tech side of the platform behind and go to the other side of the coin and say, how do we anticipate or how should we be pushing to uh, drive ecosystem and relationships and the delivery of these systems as we, uh, we move forward? Tom, how about you? Okay, so uh, for the record, Pacific time zone. Anyway, <laughs> so... All right, I'll lighten up, guys, I promise. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so... I don't know. I'm not really quite sure how to answer the question. I think that uh, the, the example you gave of a hospital is a really good one because, look, they got tons of equipment all over the place, and everyone's going in there trying to sell them. And it's, it's like one of the worst, one of the most complicated environments in the world. It's... It's rife with regulatory issues that, you know, you don't want to touch if you can get away from. So uh, going from where you are now, like with very little adoption to having, you know, this nirvana ubiquitous adoption is going to be really tough, especially in that environment. I think the way, the way you do it is you don't want to approach it from, hey, I've got this entire system that you're going to use for everything. You say, I'm going to solve, this, I'm going to solve a problem for you. What is your biggest problem? And hopefully it's a problem which doesn't touch that third rail of HIPAA or something like that that you have to deal with because that's just going to slow everything down. And the biggest problem we have right now is this, you know, unclear value proposition with the IoT in a lot of IT managers' minds, a lot of CIOs' minds. They're not completely there yet. They're, people are there with mobile. Okay, we're there with mobile. We got there. Everybody's got it. They got to get to that point with the IoT and say, I've got all these devices out there. And I, I completely agree with what was said about using existing infrastructure and existing devices. You have to do that. Otherwise, you have a problem. You're never going to get there uh, in the short term. But we've got all these devices out there. They have inherent in them the ability to provide a lot more value if you can find a way to pull it out. Right? And that's the key is to be able to do that with existing systems. You just layer something on, solve a problem solve another problem. As soon as you do that, then the value proposition becomes clear. Everybody goes, oh, I get it. And you can, and you can uh, do a lot more business and get a lot more scale. So uh, it's, a, it's an incremental approach, uh, and it's the only way it's going to work in the short term, I think. Hey, James, any view on ecosystems and relationships as it relates to platform and evolution of space? Sure. So I think Hans mentioned previously, you know, these these micro verticals, and one of the things we've seen is within the verticals, you have to look at how the economics work today, yeah. and align the solution economics to each vertical. So as a example, in forklifts, um, the money is not made on the sale of forklifts at all. It's actually made by whoever owns the maintenance contract on the forklift. 
Right. So if you're going to make connected forklifts, you need to figure out how to get into that maintenance stream of money to get the recurring stream to pay for the system. That sort of thing happens industry to industry, and the economics are very different in each vertical in terms of where you need to align yourself. Very we true. have clients in the medical space doing what you're talking about right now, trying to figure out how to make my product line connected and then later on be able to convince other medical device companies that maybe aren't sophisticated enough to do an end-to-end -end connected system, you should join my ecosystem. You should leverage my connectivity that handles the HIPAA issues, connects to EMRs, gets you your maintenance data, lets you push out your service capabilities. So vertical to vertical, I think you'll see development of the leaders in each vertical um, getting some momentum and getting the lesser uh, capable hardware companies kind of piling on uh, to join their teams. Right. Uh, we've got about uh, 10, 15 minutes of the most left. I thought it might be good if we just went around and each one of you actually highlighted a, a customer um, deployment um, for your platform and, and um, I'd say really just in the context would be useful I think to the audience on IoT Live today to just hear about you know kind of a range of these kinds of applications and um, what's been successful and what highlights um, um, what you've done with the customer. James, you want to just continue? Yes, sorry, I was getting uh, the slide up. So hopefully you can see um, my screen. Is that yep. showing up for you, Glenn? Yep. Um, so the customer I wanted to highlight today is one of ours in the transportation space, and it highlights you know some of the interesting capabilities of our platform to work across deployment topologies. So this is a very similar application, leverages lots of modules that are the same, to implement two different types of fleet tracking. One is a cellular-based system called FleetLink on the right, and the other is a RF-based system that works at distribution centers on the left. Mm -hmm. And these are both built on the BrightWolf platform. They actually share many of the same modules um, to build the application. In one case, on the left in YardLink, it runs in the customer's IT environment, run by their IT staff, and integrates with their existing yard management and load planning software. Um, and it talks again over an RF, basically quarter mile range around the DC. Then on the right, you're talking about over the road trailers. You want to monitor them in real time, do things like operate and control the locks remotely, get the weight of the, the, um, from a scale sensor of the actual unit, monitor tire pressure, see where your loads are going, and again, do integrations from the cloud uh, to back end routing control systems. And so they built the same kind of core capability of refrigerated tractor trailer monitoring on top of the BrightWolf platform and then deployed it in two different ways that support very different uh, use cases and ROIs for their end customers. Tom, you have a customer you like to highlight and put into context of use? Yeah, uh, Zebra, as you know, is a, is a printer company, so we've got a lot of applications around remote printer management and cloud printing, things like that. But what I want to talk about uh, today is uh, a uh, indoor location uh, a pilot we have going on, which had had going for quite a while, and it's been very successful. Indoor location has been a great buzzword. People have been very interested in it in the last couple of years, and so uh, we had an opportunity to come up to utilize it. So we decided to implement it. We use uh, Bluetooth Low Energy uh, beacons, like most people do, and so. What's cool about it is you've got three basic devices in the system. You know, you've got the beacon itself, you have the beacon detector, and then you have a display to basically react when, uh, when something occurs that is interesting. And there's a couple different ways to do it. One is you can have the, the beacon detector be mobile and the beacon be fixed, which is typical uh, smartphone type application like in the mall or, or retail, what have you. And uh, we chose, uh, because of the application, to have the, the beacon be mobile and the beacon detector be fixed. And that allows us to do a couple things. It allows us to use a really small beacon, uh, this, not this one, but uh, smaller than this, uh, and uh, make it a very inexpensive way to uh, attach to a person. And uh, the beacon detector was integrated into a tablet which was also a display. So although it was two devices, it was like a compound device, if you will, and in Zatar it was two different devices, they just happen to inhabit uh, the, you know, the same processing infrastructure on the edge. So it allowed us to, to build this system out, uh, which was very, very simple, 
uh, it could connect in with the customer's I, uh, Wi-Fi infrastructure, or you could have cellular-based uh, backhaul. So you really can completely stay away from their infrastructure and their IT people, and, and kind of just drop it in and operate, and basically nobody else is affected. And it was a it, w it was a very uh, good learning experience, and it also taught us the value of keeping things very very simple. You'd look at it and go. All you're doing is tracking this guy from point A, from point B to point C, but what you're doing is you're doing it in a connected way so all the data is available for later processing. It can be aggregated. It can be used for analysis. And, you know, j just something like that can be very, very valuable to certain customers. And so we, we found out that that was a very useful thing to do. Doug. Yeah, as the new guy, right? I'm not going to certainly rattle off a long laundry list, so let, let's focus on our, our approach. The first thing we elected to do is be users ourselves. So we have you know, hyper-connected not only our physical, but our virtual signal producers and data producers. Um, I mean, everything from the amperage coming out of our panels uh, to we've got a beer shelf. We're a startup, right? Uh, so we know when we're out of beer. Um, but getting more complex, we, we monitor our network. You can see some of this is real. Well, all of this behind me is real. Um, but we monocle, we monitor the air quality in our server room. Um, we monitor our log files. Uh, so we've hyper-connected ourselves and we've become users of NEO. Um, the second thing we've done is said, look, we're going to focus very hard on strategic lead users. The one I'll talk about, a highlight today, um, is still confidential, so I won't give any names, but, but it's an environment of a very successful industrial company that um, is, you know, in this day and age, it's just hyper manual, right? It's, um, you know, it's a lot of guys with clipboards running around doing things, and frankly, they do it really well. Uh, looking at from a benchmark standpoint, they're the best in the world. Um, we are literally you know, going to do an overlay across the entire organization. We're going to take the existing instrumentation, you know, things like Allen Bradley control systems, um, you know, one-off um, uh, LP gauges, uh, and then we're going to add new sensory capability and new, new workflow management. So starting with when a, when a customer shows up, uh, they're going to go from zero awareness to hyper awareness. We start from the work order. We're installing a material handling RTLS system. Uh, so from the moment the order receives, uh, we will access the, the customer information from Oracle. We'll incorporate that into a work order because they have various terms for various customers. Uh, today, that's all manual. Um, a customer has the ability to jump the queue, right? Uh, depending on the customer terms. Uh, certain customers are more profitable than others, right? So we're going into, into work order management and material planning from a production standpoint. Um, you know, we plan on using active RTLS uh, throughout the facility. Uh, when we get inside the plant, we'll be automating the queue. Uh, so rather than you know, at the, at the current as is, the next day they look at how many pounds they produced. That's it. That's the metric. That's how they know if they've had a good day, right? <laughs> um, we'll do things like monitor uh, uh, fluid level, pH levels. Um, the great use case is fire. Uh, one of these places catches on fire, it's highly caustic. It's let it burn and run. That's the workflow. Um, so. <laughs> We're putting very advanced flame detection in that if, if flame is detected, it shuts the LP off. Yeah. Now, I mean, for those of us that are used to connecting stuff, that seems like a no-brainer, right? Um, particularly since, you know, one of these places burns down, it's 30 million bucks. Um, but it's not that simple. It's not that simple with enterprise back-end systems. So it's one that then we go deeper. We go into predictive maintenance. If a motor blows in one of these places, they're out of business, right? Um, so we're connecting elements of the workflow. We're embracing the existing signals. We're adding new signal producers. And then we're putting, you know, high contextual logic depending at the edge. Um, and the cool thing about this is, you know, we did our, we, we're through the prototype. We're going into facility one. There are 36 locations. 
Um, but the prototype we did with, you know, four nodes, each node costing less than 100 bucks. So the total hardware ad was 400 bucks. You know, so there's nothing for the IT guys to push back on, <laughs> right? Yep. We told them we're, we told them we're going to have access on the front end to the customer information on the back end. When we're all done, we're going to go from a load cell, pump the actual weight straight into Oracle. Uh, they charge by the pound. Uh, today, that's a three-step manual process loaded. I mean, I mean, literally starts with pencil on a clipboard. So, you know, it's an exciting lead user because there's it, it's there's just gold everywhere. But it's also a gnarly, gnarly, gnarly situation. And the next thing is, you know, our model is we want to be we want to be anonymous. We play well with with everybody, right? Um, frankly, we really don't aspire to be a software company. We kind of aspire to be an enabling company. So we're starting to work with distributors. You know, one of our distributors is taking us in. You know, we are in a demand economy. There's nobody argues that. The customers are winning. The customers are smarter than us because we're trying to fulfill it out of batch. So one of our distributors has taken us to some of the, let's say, the top five retailers in the world. And we're going to really consider how do you create a closer to real-time perception of inventory. The days of excess inventory, excess people, you know, every retailer is getting crushed because of the capital associated with, with inventory. Every retailer is getting crushed with 10 to 12 percent out of stock levels, right? Uh, Wall Street's tearing them up. So, you know, we're going to start by, you know, identifying the points that really, really highlight demand, which is like the transaction of the POS system, and then work it backwards, right? Um, so that's those are the two things that you know we're hyper focused on now. But again, we're the new guys and um, don't have a you know a long list yet. But we're working hard. Sounds great. Hans, did I scare you away with my convoluted question? <laughs> <laughs> I Sorry. apologize. My, uh, my PC fell off the uh, network. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, uh, maybe a customer example from Exosite that um, highlights some of the points that would be worth uh, hearing about from a deployment standpoint. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, um, you know, we, we started in 2009 primarily in the industrial sector because really the cost saver business model uh, in that sector was the kind of the most um, advanced business model and the most customers were there. But since that time, we now have 397 different device types connected and, um, and across, uh, you know, uh, about 16 different industries. And um, as we do everything from, you know, wastewater effluent monitoring and nuclear power plants through, you know, monitoring professional athletes at, uh, at uh, you know, some of the world's largest sporting events. Um, and, and and in each of those things, you know, what we've been able to do is kind of uh, thread the needle through uh, the different areas that these, uh, these different industries need uh, to be able to deploy solutions uh, for their industry. Um, you know, uh, and, and I think the, the interesting piece is where we're really seeing value being created that is above and beyond just, you know, data being there reliably and availably is really in uh, the visualization, the way in which to actually quickly uh, visualize what's going on and understand what's happening in your uh, kind of cacophony of IoT uh, deployed devices. Um, the other area is, is the analytics, right? And you know, some of the some of the folks are mentioning about how they can go on really kind of low cost devices today, and um, and uh, do those analytics and uh, you know on, on devices that are very very resource constrained. You're shifting the burden of processing uh, to the cloud, and that's really kind of a stream analytics where you're running more of a filter on the data coming in, so you can understand is there a you know a predictive maintenance event? Is there does that mean the race is over? You know, the different types of uh, you know decisions you have to make on the streams of information, and then you know our, our CTO recently tweeted about you know, the, you know an integration with R, the uh, you know kind of the, the analytical tool and tool set. And, um, and, and some other things that we're doing to overlay big data, kind of the subject domain versus the time domain, and uh, do really the analytics at the higher level. So you can tell in certain industries, for example, in the pest control industry, you want to understand pest pressure, right, across a certain geography. And in order to do that, you're not just looking at a per device 
uh, piece of information, understanding what that device's stream of information means. You're actually looking across all devices, across all user uh, behavior in that ecosystem and drawing conclusions for the industry. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are just a couple of the applications that we work with today. That's great. I think we have burned our time slot. Um, so first of all, I would uh, like to again thank all the people attending, but but really thank all of you for uh, participating in the panel today. It's a rich spectrum of experience. Um, I think a lot of um, shared and common understanding about where this is all going. So Tom, James, Hans, and Doug, thank you, thank you so much.